Hello and welcome to another episode of Interactive Biology TV, where we're making biology fun. My name is Leslie Samuel, and in this episode, episode 55, I'm going to be talking about regulating peripheral resistance, and this is going to be part one. Initially, I was going to make one video about peripheral resistance, but then I started going into it and I decided to split it up into at least two parts. So this is going to be the first part and it might end up being two parts. It might end up being three parts. We'll see how it all turns out. So we've been talking about the cardiovascular system or the circulatory system. We have spoken a lot about the heart and the blood vessels that lead from the heart and to the heart. And we said that when the heart beats and let's say the ventricles contract, that sends the blood. Um, if it's the left ventricle, it sends the blood into the aorta, which then sends the blood into the rest of the body. It's going to the organs and to the tissues. Um, it's taking oxygen and nutrients to those organs and the muscles and so on. And, of course, it's bringing waste away from the muscles and organs also. So what we're going to do today, uh, we've been talking about cardiac output. We've been talking about mean arterial pressure. And in the last episode, we focused on mean arterial pressure. And we said that MAP, mean arterial pressure, is equal to CO times PR. This is one of the formulas that we use for calculating mean arterial pressure. Just as a reminder, the other one is MAP is equal to, I'm just going to write DP for diastolic pressure, plus one-thirds of systolic pressure minus diastolic pressure. And you can go back to episode 54 for more of an explanation on these two. We're not going to focus on this guy right here. We are focusing on this indirectly. Why? Because today we're going to talk about peripheral resistance. And we already defined what peripheral resistance is. Peripheral resistance is basically opposition to blood flow. And of course, you have the heart that's beating and sending the blood through these blood vessels. But of course, it's not a frictionless environment. There's going to be friction between the blood and the walls of the blood vessels. And um, that is going to cause resistance. If something is trying to get through a tube, there is resistance. And this is exactly what we have here. The blood is trying to get through many tubes all throughout the body. And of course, that is going to encounter resistance. Just to give you kind of an idea, if you were to take all of the blood vessels out of your body and just um, make it in one long line, it would be long enough to wrap around the globe twice. So we have a significant amount of blood vessels going through the body. All right, so that is what peripheral resistance is. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how we can regulate peripheral resistance. So I said we have the heart, and that sends the blood to the rest of the body. And there are a number of different types of vessels that we can encounter. Uh, we have, of course, the aorta. And we've looked at this. And from the aorta, it's going to go to arteries. And from the arteries, it's going to go to arterioles. And from the arterioles, it's going to go to the capillaries. And then from the capillaries, let's use a different color here. That's going to take us to the venules, to the veins, and then via the vena 
sorry here Kava and then that is gonna go back to the heart and that cycle continues now when it comes to peripheral resistance the place that we're gonna focus on would be the arterioles the aorta and the arteries are relatively thick Yes, they are flexible, but we don't have much in terms of changing the diameter of these guys. The arterioles has a smooth muscle layer, a significant smooth muscle layer that we can constrict or we can dilate. And if we constrict it, it's gonna, the diameter is going to be smaller. And if that's the case, that is going to increase peripheral resistance. If we expand it, if we relax the muscles, we dilate the muscles, the arterioles are going to expand, and of course, that's going to decrease peripheral resistance. And it's really simple. It is harder to get something through a very narrow tube than it is to get something through a thicker tube. So by constricting the arterioles, that is going to increase peripheral resistance by dilating the arterioles that is going to decrease peripheral resistance and just to kind of give you a visual here here we have an artery we're delivering blood to a, a specific tissue whatever that is so we have some tissue cells here and from the arteries it goes via arterioles and then we have the capillaries going to the venule and then to the vein and as I said before, then back to the vena cava and back to the heart. So the magic is happening right here in the arterioles. If we have some constriction, that is going to increase peripheral resistance. If we have dilation, that's going to decrease peripheral resistance. Now that we know that, let's talk about some specific instances and some specific ways in which uh, we can have these kinds of effects. We're going to look at two hormones. We're going to look at epinephrine. Which is another name for adrenaline. And you've heard a lot about adrenaline. And we're also going to look at nor epinephrine. So these are the two that we're going to look at today. First, we're going to focus on epinephrine. The interesting thing about these things, I'm going through one example of one pathway for each. But epinephrine, for example, in certain instances, it can be a vasoconstrictor. In other instances, it can be a vasodilator. And what we're going to do, the typical one that you hear about is the vasoconstriction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how this causes vasodilation. Epinephrine binds to what we call beta-2 receptors beta 2 receptors and these are on the muscle the smooth muscle of the arterioles and then what that's going to do is it's going to activate a G protein which then is going to activate an enzyme called adenylate cyclase and what this enzyme is going to do it's going to take ATP adenosine triphosphate which is the energy currency of the body and convert that into a different form and that's going to be cyclic AMP what that's going to do is it's going to activate calcium pumps in the cisternae of the smooth muscle cells. And that is going to cause the calcium to be pumped back into the cisternae, which is going to decrease calcium levels. So we're going to get calcium decrease. Now, if you remember from one of the earlier episodes, calcium in the muscle causes muscle contraction. So if we're decreasing the calcium, we're not going to get contraction, which would cause constriction. We're going to get vasodilation. 
All right, now when we have vasodilation, of course, what that's going to do is it's going to decrease peripheral resistance because we have a wider tube, blood can flow much easier, so that's going to cause a decrease in peripheral resistance. So this is one example of one way in which epinephrine can affect peripheral resistance. Now let's talk about norepinephrine. So let's come over here and norepinephrine is going to activate a different type of receptor and we're going to call those alpha receptors and then that is going to activate a G protein once again However, in this case, the G protein is not going to activate adenylate cyclase. It's going to activate phospho, phosphatidyl inositol. And then that is going to activate the molecule IP3. And that is going to do the exact opposite. That's going to cause calcium release from the cisternae. And of course, now we have calcium release. That is going to cause contraction, which in this case would be vasoconstriction. And, of course, then the effect of that is going to be to increase peripheral resistance. So, we've been looking at the formula. MAP is equal to CO times PR. In these situations, we are affecting PR, which is peripheral resistance. And if you increase peripheral resistance, which would be the effect of norepinephrine in this specific situation, that is going to cause an increase in the mean arterial pressure. If you decrease peripheral resistance, as in this situation, that is going to cause a decrease in mean arterial pressure. So by influencing vasodilation or vasoconstriction, what we're doing is we are making the diameter of the blood vessels smaller or larger, and that is going to influence peripheral resistance. If it's smaller, we have more resistance. It's harder to get stuff through. If it's larger, it's going to be easier to get stuff through because there's less resistance to flow. There's one more thing that I want to add to this. Here we have an example of atherosclerosis, and that is where we have plaque buildup in the arteries. So here you can see the plaque, and that is building up in the arteries. And what that's going to do is it's going to cause us to have a narrowed artery. So the diameter is going to be significantly smaller. This can happen as a result of having too much cholesterol in our diets. And that's just an example. But that is going to cause a smaller opening. And of course, if you have a smaller opening, what that's going to do is it's going to increase peripheral resistance. And if you're increasing peripheral resistance, and we know that MAP is going to be equal to CO times PR, you increase this bad boy over here, that is going to increase the mean arterial pressure. So you're basically increasing your blood pressure when there is plaque in the arteries, and you're doing that by increasing peripheral resistance. Take-home message is watch your diet, exercise, live a healthy lifestyle so that this doesn't happen, so that this doesn't go up, and so that your blood pressure, your mean arterial pressure, does not go up. That's the health nugget for this lesson. And that's pretty much it for this episode. As usual, you can visit the website at interactive-biology.com for more biology videos and other resources that we're adding over there. This is Leslie Samuel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.